Hi class, today we're going to be talking about your first 10 beef cattle breeds. So one thing that you want to remember here is that there are two possible scientific names. Um, most of the cattle that we raise in the U.S. are Bos taurus, but remember we do have those zebu cattle who are Bos indicus, and we've talked about the differences between those before. So one thing that you want to keep in mind is make sure you know which scientific name applies to each breed. And remember that if it's a composite breed that has some Brahmin cattle, which are one of the Bos indicus types in it, then you'll probably need to list both scientific names because they're really kind of both species at that point. They're a cross between the two. So breed number one is the Beef Master, and this was the first American composite breed. And it's a composite breed of Herefords, Brahmins, and Shorthorns. And it was first bred in the early 1900s in the US. So since it's a composite breed, you're gonna list both scientific names for it since it has a little bit of both in it. It comes in many different colors, but most of the common ones are either a reddish brown or a dunton color. Um, and they come in both polled and horned varieties. So polled means that they genetically do not have horns. So these guys can have them or not. Uh, they're very hardy. They're well suited to the Texas climate. They milk well, so they're a good dual purpose cow, and they're very intelligent and fairly gentle. Then we have the belted Galloway, and this guy a lot of times is known as the Oreo cookie cow for obvious reasons. That white belt that you see is actually a dominant trait, so they can be born without it if they get two copies of the recessive gene. And they're usually black, outside of that belt, but they can come in a brown base color as well with the white belt. They're the oldest known British breed, and they have soft wavy hair with a thick undercoat, and that allows them to survive in very cold, wet weather. So these were bred in the Galloway region, um, which was known for that rainy, cold weather. Number three is one of the most likely breeds for you to see around here, um, and that is the Angus. The official name is Aberdeen Angus. They come from Scotland, and they are the second most popular beef breed in the U.S. and the most popular probably in Maryland. Um, they're known for their marbling in their meat, so they produce a really high quality meat with a lot of that intramuscular fat, and that's going to make it really buttery in flavor, so that's really sought after. So sometimes you will see the beef labeled specifically Angus beef for that reason. And as of 1954, Red Angus, which is this one down here, was actually recognized as a separate breed from Black Angus. So these started out all as one breed, and now that red color has been selectively bred for, as has the black one, and they're actually two separate breed registries. But for our purposes, we are going to combine them together. Number four is Blonda Aquitaine, or a lot of times these are just referred to as blondes. And you can see where they get their name. They have that blonde hair color. Um, so this is a breed that was developed from a variety of draft milk and meat breeds. Um, and it was developed in the south of France, where there are a lot of plains, hills, and mountains. So it's quite a variety of different climates. And because of that, it led to a really highly adaptable cow that can live anywhere and can be used for many different purposes. They're known for their lean meat, um, and they're also very fine boned, which is good when you're raising a beef cow because it leads to a higher dressing percentage. You're going to get more meat off of that animal. They are also known for really great muscling and they have superior feed efficiency compared to other breeds. So it's not going to cost as much to feed them to produce the same amount of meat that another breed would. So with the exception of that beef master, which was that composite breed, all of the cattle that we've seen so far are Bos taurus, which is much more common around here since those were the European breeds that were originally brought over. So number five is our only true Bos indicus, pure Bos indicus cow that we have on the list, and that is the Brahmin. And this is the most common zebu cattle that you'd find in the U.S. 
Um, so you can see that Brahmins look quite a bit different than most of your Bose Taurus breeds. One of the things that they have is this enlarged dewlap in the front of their body here, and this probably helps them with thermal regulation, regulating their body temperature, because they have all of those flaps of skin that creates extra surface area to help them cool off. Remember that Bose Indicus breeds come from hot areas like India and Africa, so thermal regulation is very important for this breed. This hump that they have above their shoulder here is actually a fat deposit. Think of it like a camel. So it allows them to store nutrients, mostly in the form of fat, and water in that area, which helps them, again, live in these very hot, dry environments. Uh, because they were bred to be so hardy, they actually have fairly poor carcass quality. So they're not the best beef cattle for that reason. They are a dual purpose cow, so you can milk them or use them for meat. Um, and their main use in the U.S. is actually in the development of new breeds, of composite breeds. Because when they're crossbred, the hybrids, such as the beef master, and you're going to see another one later on, inherit those positive traits that they have, such as the ability to withstand really high heat. These guys are also really disease resistant, so that's a great trait to have. Um, but since we're crossbreeding, those hybrids will produce a much higher quality meat than the Brahmin cow itself would. One other really neat thing about Brahmins is they actually secrete basically a built-in insect repellent. Um, so that's another thing that comes in handy, especially in a lot of hot regions of the world. So all of those great features make them the perfect crossbreeding cow, um, but they're not going to probably be able to survive in a lot of our cooler environments in the U.S. And because of that, they're mostly used for breeding purposes. So speaking of Brahmins, here we have another uh, composite breed. So again, this is a Bose Taurus, Bose Indicus mix, um, and that is the Brangus. And it got its name Brangus because it is Brahmin and Angus combined. So just like Angus cattle, these either come in a black variety or a red variety. And they are always polled. They never have horns, also like the Angus cows. Um, they have an enlarged dewlap, a lot like the Brahmin cattle. So you can see that's one way that you can tell them apart from the Angus cows is you have those flaps of skin in that area. Um, and their ears do tend to flop a little bit more than Angus, although you can see they're nothing like the floppy ears of a Brahmin. Um, and by the way, those floppy ears of the Brahmin probably help with a couple of things, insect control and also thermal regulation since it's so much surface area that's going to allow them to cool off. So the Brangus have some of those traits, um, but they have all the positive qualities of the Angus. So they have that great marbling in their meat. Their meat's going to be a lot higher quality than Brahmin, but they're going to be able to live in a warmer or harsher environment than an Angus cow would because of those Brahmin traits that they carry. Breed number seven is a Charlet, and Charlet are actually really popular in our local area, so you may have seen these around. So they are a white cow, um, sometimes a little bit tannish colored, but usually more of a true white. And they have a pink skin underneath, which might give them a pinkish or even a whiter color. Um, they do have horns, usually they can be removed, um, but they're slender white tapered horns. And they are a French breed, as you can probably tell from the name. They're one of the larger breeds. They're going to stand a little bit bigger than the other breeds that you'll see. And we breed them mostly because they're known for a larger than usual round and loin area. So if you look at the cow and you remember your beef cuts, that round is this back rump area here. And then the loin is this area through here. And if you think about where a lot of the expensive cuts of meat come from on a cow, a lot come from that loin area, that tenderloin, the sirloin, all of those good steaks that you usually get, that's all from that area. So if you have a cow that's really good at bulking up right in that area, that's going to be great for beef production. So really popular locally, one of the major beef cows that you'll see in Harford County. 
So we're going from the one white cow that's very common around here to one that you probably will not see, but it's a really interesting breed and that's the Chianina. So this is an Italian breed and it is one of the oldest in the world. It is closely related to the ancient aurochs that all domesticated cattle came from. Um, and this breed is thought to have existed before the Roman Empire. It was originally bred as a draft breed for pulling equipment, pulling wagons, things like that. Um, but now it is more used for meat. Um, and they do come in multiple colors, but they are usually white. Their size and their type can vary considerably because the breed is so old and there aren't as many selected characteristics bred into it. You can see that the shape of the body is not as square as most beef cattle and you have a lot more muscling in these front shoulders and that's because they were bred for pulling things mostly originally. Um, and these guys are really just unique in their giant size. They are one of the fastest growing breeds um, from birth. And they also, um, on average, are much bigger than other bulls or other cows of different breeds. Although they aren't actually the largest individual bull or cow in the world. So we're going to go from our largest breed with the Chianina to our smallest breed, which is the Dexter. And the Dexter is an Irish breed, and it's the smallest of all the European breeds. It's half the size of a Hereford, which we're gonna see next week, so about half the size of an Angus cow as well. And you can tell that from the guy standing here in the picture, whereas the Chianina was towering over this six-foot guy, here's a six-foot guy that could easily um, be double the height of a Dexter. Um, so these guys come in multiple colors, but they're mostly either black, uh, this rusty red color, or a dun, which is a tan color. They're multiple purpose breeds, so they're used for milk and meat, and also as oxen. They can pull small carts and things like that. This is known as a hobby farmer's breed because it can do everything on the farm, and they're really easy to raise on a small scale. So their milk is very rich. It's similar to a Jersey milk with a really high butter fat. And because of all these characteristics, they make them perfect for someone who wants to do subsistence farming, where they're going to basically raise enough meat um, and milk and that kind of thing to support their family. So someone who's kind of living off the grid, the Dexter cow is a great choice for them. Then that brings us to our last breed, which is somewhat similar, and that is the Jobavaya. And Jobavayas are a little bit bigger than Dexter's. You can see that these come up somewhere mid-chest on a six-foot guy, whereas these were down at waist level. Um, and they also come in multiple colors. So it's usually a cream color up to a kind of a reddish-yellow color. Um, they're medium weight cows, so they're not as big as some of the Angus cattle and that kind of thing, um, but they still will produce a lot of meat. And they also have good milking ability, so they are dual purpose. They're very fertile. They tend to calve with ease, which makes raising them a lot easier. And they're also really good mothers. And their calves gain weight quickly, which makes it a profitable breed since you're going to be able to get to that finishing step faster. So these are your first 10 breeds for the week. Make sure that you've got all the important details in your um, breed ID notebooks. And then, of course, at the end of this two-week period, you will be taking a quiz on these. Have a great day.